This film's really the culmination of about 10 years of working in the Northern Territory, making wildlife films. As a filmmaker, you don't often get presented with, with a chance to do something as ambitious, you know, a, a 3D giant screen film in some of the most beautiful locations on Earth. So, so really, this is, this is possibly the highlight of my filmmaking career. We've had 100 days of camping in the bush, filming a small crew with some incredible people and all of this in Aboriginal communities, which is just such a privilege. After spending so much time in those communities with those people and learning from them where, how, when to go and find the creatures and what they'd be doing, I really came to appreciate their understanding of the natural world. And, and I guess it's at that point that this film was born because it's that understanding that led to this film. It's really a, a wildlife film from an Aboriginal perspective. From a technical point of view, we had to overcome some really big obstacles. We had to find a way for a small crew of three people to get large high resolution cameras into extremely remote areas. It was really great to be part of such an ambitious project. Shooting for IMAX and giant screen in 3D is really quite tricky. It's not your usual camera, it's not your usual storytelling. So being out in the bush, in fires, on swamps, it can really mess things up. A 2D red setup had to be lightweight and ready to go, but the 3D rig pretty much came straight off a Hollywood set. It's big and it's got two cameras, one horizontal and one vertical, bouncing off a 45 degree mirror on the front. Right, now imagine having that in the bush. It's like uh, carrying around a pane of glass 24 seven. The nest mustn't be too far now because we've got a bit of a croc slide in the grass there, which will be a place where she rests. She's got a slide over here, but that's her main entrance over there. There's a little one hiding. He's obviously hatched before the others. I'm going to pick them up, I'm going to try to get bitten. They're a bit like their mums, they're kind of aggro, these little critters. Got How about that, eh? Isn't he gorgeous? These guys were hunted to near extinction. Right about the time when I was being born, these guys were nearly at their end and they've been protected up here. And so now you've suddenly got this incredible population of crocs. He's going the wrong way. He's heading, heading off in the wrong direction, so. I might uh, give him a little bit of a head start and put him down where his mum is. Hopefully she won't see me. And you got a big guy. Cute. Salties in Australia, if you get in the water with a salty, it will attack you and kill you every time. It's not like a shark where there are behaviours to be aware of and, and times when it's okay. Salties is every time. So, so the big challenge was trying to film those underwater and for that I got cinematographer John Shaw in. Lisa, we went off into Arnhem Land and we were shooting um, crocodiles in the, in the wetlands and I was there doing pole cams to try and get, you know, half-halves of crocodiles in the wild, shots underwater, tracking shots. Okay, we've had this one crocodile in the, and he was eating a barramundi and we were able to kind of maneuver super close here. It's like this fantastic shot and then all of a sudden the crocodile just goes smash and just bit the camera. And it took the camera clean off the pole um, and then started swimming off down the uh, billabong with it in its mouth. 
Um, at which point we all were like, oh my God, we've got to grab this the camera back. So we basically chased the crocodile down, whacked its tail, it let go of the camera, and then luckily we were able to sneak around and Nick grab the camera out of the water. I mean, the camera's insured, right? So that's one thing, but really, the, the most valuable thing was the shot, you know? It was an extremely cool shot, um, and it made it into the final cut. After trying for weeks to get good underwater shots in the wild, we eventually realised it was too hard. The only shots we were able to get were crocodiles attacking the camera. So we decided to film a large pet crocodile underwater in a pond with a cage to protect John. And the first thing that actually struck me about the animal was the noise that it made. It literally growled like a dinosaur, what I would imagine a dinosaur would growl like. And then I'm talking to Nick, the, the director. I'm kind of looking down, and this crocodile has stuck his nose and mouth probably maybe a foot and a half through the cage, and my arm would have only been probably maybe 10, 15 centimetres away from his mouth. And I'm talking to Nick very, very casually, because I kind of didn't really worry about it. But then I looked down and I saw this crocodile, how close it had got to me, and I realised that this crocodile was just waiting for me to make one mistake, and it was just going to grab hold of me, and I was going to go through that tiny hole in the chicken wire, and it might look like it's subdued, and it might look like it doesn't care, but it is always on, and it is always ready to take advantage of a situation. Australia used to be made up of about 500 Aboriginal clan groups, and the area we're working in with this film, the top end of Australia, is still largely owned by those Aboriginal people. So we had to get their permission to go into their land and, and, and film these sites. People like Jeff Lee allowed us into Twin Falls and Jim Jim Falls. This is an important sacred site to his people. It's a real privilege to have been allowed in there to capture it in full flow. Another Indigenous elder, Charlie Mangulda, took us out to, to some of the most incredible art sites I've ever seen. Charlie's probably in his 80s. He comes from a wetland area in Arnhem Land. And everywhere you look, every rock formation, every cave has ancient art on the walls that's so spectacularly beautiful. And we went into one of those caves with him, and he happened to mention that he lived in this one as a child. And it's really in that moment that the story sunk in. They're not just art sites or archaeological curiosities. They're really homes. It wasn't that long ago. This world has changed so much for these people. This film really came about as a result of a friendship with a man called Balang Lewis. Balang was a traditional elder in Arnhem Land. He's also a well-known actor in Australia. And he really opened the doors for me to, to Northern Australia. Um, we spent a lot of time with him out in the bush and just hanging out, really. And, and that's where the seeds for this film were planted. What about like this? No, fire, fire, Montgomery, sorry. <laughs> the commentary in this film is all derived from conversations I had with him. Um, it's his take on Northern Australia. It's, um, it's his vision of wilderness that's described in the film. He was the inspiration behind the story and the reason we chose the crocodile. The crocodile's one of Balang's totems. But luckily for Caspar, the Northern Barrier Reef nestles against some of the most pristine coastal rivers on the planet. That was really nice. Let's do that again. That one, please. <laughs> 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 Tragically, he, um, he died just before we finished the film. Um, we had recorded everything. We'd done everything. It was the final stages of post-production when, when Balang passed away. and. Uh, so he unfortunately never got to see it on a big screen. But uh, the film's now dedicated to him and I'm really, really glad we got to make it. It's just in time.
just in time for him to tell his story. Light the skies, light your magazine, fade it all again for love, 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 love me, love my land, love my tides like the wind. Come on, my land, 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 my land,